This is the first of four videos for IB higher level physics multiple choice questions. You can get the multiple choice questions either in answered form or in blank unanswered form so you can answer them yourself from the description to this video. So give them a try before you watch the video and then you can use this video to mark them. So question one, we've got a lake that is higher up than a turbine, higher up above the ground. So we've got a height of 90 meters. We've got water flowing down that and the water is flowing at 2,400 kilograms per minute. And 240, 2,400 kilograms per minute divided by 60 is the flow rate per second. So 2,400 divided by 60 is 40, so 40 kilograms per second. And the turbine has an efficiency of 75%, which we'll come into in a minute. So we know that the potential energy is going to be converted into electrical energy. So the potential energy is given by mg delta h. That's the change in potential energy. And that's going to equal the change in energy within the turbine. Uh, and we want to find out the output power of the turbine. So the energy here per second, we can call that the, the energy here per second, we can call that the input power. So the input power is the mass of the water, which we're taking as a, a kilogram because it's 40 kilograms per second. So that's 40 kilograms in one second. Uh, gravity is 9.81 and the change in height is 90 meters. So 40 times 9.81 times 90 gives 35,316 joules. But, so you would think that B was the answer, but the turbine only has an efficiency of 75%, so the output power has got to be 75% of that, which gives us about 26 kilowatts, which is A. Question two. Uh, energy transfers is an engine. This is just simply rearranging or using your efficiency formula. So you have the output energy here, the wasted energy here, and the input energy here. Efficiency is just... Uh, energy out divided by energy in uh, times 100 if you want to make that into a percentage. <clears throat> but here we've got energy out divided by energy in, which is C. Question three, an electron X is accelerated from rest through a potential difference V. Another electron Y is accelerated through a potential difference 2V. After acceleration, these are the de Broglie wavelengths. The speeds reached by the equations, by the electron, sorry, are well below that of the speed of light. Okay, so we want the ratio of the two de Broglie wavelengths of those two electrons. Um, so we know that the kinetic energy given to the electrons is the charge multiplied by the potential difference. Um, and... So we can therefore say that half times the mass times the velocity squared is EV, which rearranges to give you uh, the velocity is the square root of 2EV over the mass. And in this case, we're talking about an electron, so the mass of an electron. Uh, if we simplify that a little bit, we can say that the velocity, therefore, is proportional to the square root of the voltage. Difficult to use two Vs here, so I'll try and make that a bigger V. Um, we also know that uh, the wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength of something, is Planck's constant divided by its momentum. And so in this case, lambda equals h over mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron. Momentum is mass times velocity. Um, so in that case, we can get... Uh, a relationship between lambda here and the potential difference here, which is what we want for the question, because lambda here is proportional to 1 over the velocity of the electron, and the velocity of the electron is proportional to the square root of the potential difference. And so that gives us the fact that the de Broglie wavelength is proportional to 1 over the square root of 
the potential difference. Now we can put that into our equations over here and we can say therefore that the ratio of lambda x over lambda y is the same as the ratio of 1 over the square root of the potential difference in x divided by 1 over the square root of the potential difference in y. What we also know here is that vy here, vy equals from here, uh, vy is 2vx, so 2vx. So then we can substitute that in and we get, uh, where am I going to do this? Over here, so we get 1 over root vx over 1 over root 2 vx. And if we multiply that out and cancel through by vx, or square root of vx, sorry, then we get root 2, which is b. So 3 is b. Question 4. Two black bodies, x and y, are at different temperatures. The temperature of body y is higher than that of body x. Which of the following shows the black body spectra for the two bodies? Well, first of all, if the temperature is higher, then the intensity is going to be higher. So y, the peak of y needs to be higher up than the peak of x, which rules out a, and it also rules out d. Also remember that if the temperature of something is higher, then its peak wavelength is shorter. So not only does y need to be higher, like it says here, but it also needs to be to the left. So the only answer that does that is C. Question five, an acceleration and time graph. Which of the following is the speed of the object? Well, this is a reasonably easy one because the speed of an object from an acceleration time graph is just the area under the curve or area under the line. So in this case, that's half the base times the height, which is 5 times 15, which is 75 meters per second. Question six, a ball is released at time t equals zero over a horizontal surface. The graph shows a variation of velocity with time. Okay, so if we, we're looking for the highest point of the ball after one bounce. So where is the bounce? Well, first of all, it starts here. And here the velocity is increasing, so you assume that it's moving downwards. So this is down, and this is up. So uh, if it's moving downwards, the velocity is positive, and if it's moving upwards, the velocity is negative. So here it stops moving downwards and very, very, very quickly starts moving upwards. Now that is clearly what the bounce is. So ABC, that line ABC is the bounce. It's the time it's in contact with the floor. After it leaves the floor, it starts moving up. And at point D, it starts moving down again. Remember, above the x-axis is down. So at point D is when it stops moving up and starts moving down again. So that is the highest point after one bounce. So the answer there must be D. A bow of mass 400 grams shoots an arrow of mass 120 grams vertically upwards. The potential energy stored in the bow just before release is 80 joules. The system has an efficiency of 28%. Okay, so we've got the energy of the bow just before release is 80 joules. And all of that is going to be converted into kinetic energy of the arrow, not kinetic energy of the bow. So kinetic energy of the arrow, when it um, is leaving the bow is 80 joules, and all of that is converted into potential energy at the top of the, uh, the top of the arrow's flight. So EP at the top is 80 joules. Uh, now we know that EP equals mgh, which in this case is 0 0.12, because it's 120 grams, times 9.81 times h equals 80, and if you multiply that out, that gives you an answer of B, 19 meters. Question eight, the electric field strength between two parallel plates is uniform. Which graph shows how the potential V varies with distance D from the positive plate? Well, the way that I would do this is I would draw, I'm just doing it a different color so you can distinguish it from the question above. I would draw my parallel plates. That really helps me. So I'm gonna say, here are my parallel plates, here's my field. And here in green are my equipotentials. Okay, now you should remember that your equipotentials are always at 90 degrees to these uh, to the field lines. So that was always 90 degrees there. And in this case, the equipotentials are always going horizontal. 
and they're equally spaced, which they always are with parallel plates. So in that case, what we have is we have, um, let's say that this is one volt and that's zero volts. So you've got a potential difference of one volt there. Now this would therefore be uh, two thirds of a volt. This would therefore be one third of a volt. So the, the potential is changing at a constant rate. So if we take this as the positive plate, how does the potential vary with distance? Well, it's going to decrease and it's going to decrease linearly. It's going to go one third, sorry, it's going to go one volt, two thirds of a volt, one third of a volt, zero volts. So it's decreasing linearly. And the only one that decreases linearly is B. Question nine, an oil droplet has become charged by gaining five electrons. The droplet remains stationary between charged plates. Okay, so the first thing that we know is the charge on the oil droplet is 5E. The magnitude and direction of the electrostatic force on the oil droplet. Okay, so the first thing that we can do is we can think about the magnitude of the force. Okay, so the electric field strength from your data booklet is the change in potential over the change in distance. And in this case, the change in potential is 5,000 volts divided by 0 0.8 centimeters, which is 0 0.008 uh, meters. So that gives you an electric field strength. Now your electric field strength can also tell you the force because force is electric field strength times the charge on the object. So the electric force is equal to 5,000 divided by 0 0.8, 0 0.008, which is your electric field strength here. And multiply that by the charge, which is 5 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that gives you a force of 5 times 10 to the minus 13 newtons. So we know that it's either C or D. And now we need to figure out if it's up or down. Well, the oil droplet has gained five electrons, so that must be a negatively charged oil droplet. And so a negatively charged oil droplet is going to be attracted to this positive plate and repelled, and not repelled because it's zero volts, so it's only going to be attracted from this positive plate. If it's attracted to the positive plate, the force is going to be upwards, so it must be C. Finally, question 10. A particle interacts with its antiparticle, each has rest mass m. Which one of the following can occur? Okay, so let's take, for example, a proton and an antiproton. They're going to interact. What's going to happen? Well, we're certainly not going to form a neutral particle of rest mass 2m because as soon as a particle and an antiparticle meet, they annihilate. So we're definitely not forming a neutral particle. So it can't be either of those two. It could either be C or D. So either we produce two photons, each of energy mc squared, or all rest mass and energy disappears. Now, remember that mass energy must be conserved. So there is never, ever going to be a situation, apart from perhaps in tiny virtual particles, which are around for a tiny fraction of a second, if you're thinking about the uncertainty principle, there will never be a situation where mass and energy is not conserved. So there will never be a situation where you could have two particles and all of a sudden there's no particles and no energy. Remember that E equals mc squared. And so the amount of energy, the energy equivalence of one of these particles is mc squared. The energy of one of, of this particle is mc squared as well. And so we're going to produce two photons and each one of those is going to have energy mc squared. So the answer must be C. If you want to see some more of that, if you want to uh, carry on with these questions, then please follow the next three videos. If you want to see some more questions like that, please have a look at the next three videos. This is a 40 mark paper and there are three more videos to answer questions 11 through 40.